Welcome to this Medicine Masterclass on Diabetes Mellitus. Diabetes Mellitus is a chronic metabolic condition characterized by insulin resistance and insufficient insulin production. Hyperglycemia is the major metabolic consequence of this condition and that can result in serious microvascular complications such as retinopathy, nephropathy and neuropathy as well as macrovascular complications such as stroke, renal disease, limb ischemia and cardiovascular disease. Diabetes results from decreased insulin secretion and insulin resistance and there is an 80% concordance in identical twins pointing towards a strong genetic component and this progresses from an initial impaired glucose tolerance. There is maturity onset diabetes of the young which is a rare autosomal, autosomal dominant form of type 2 diabetes affecting young patients. Patients will present with symptoms of polyuria and polydipsia, drinking lots feeling thirsty and passing urine frequently. They will also feel dehydrated or they may present as a consequence of symptoms related to micro or macrovascular complications such as decreasing vision, poor visual acuity or chest pain. In order to make the diagnosis there are various diagnostic criteria. A fasting plasma glucose of less than 5 millimoles per litre is considered normal. A fasting plasma glucose of more than 7 is diagnostic of diabetes. In between this, a fasting plasma glucose of 5.5 to 7 is considered pre-diabetes. An oral glucose tolerance test, this is where a patient is fasted overnight and then 75 grams of glucose is dissolved in 300 mils of water and given as a drink in the morning. Two hours following this glucose drink, the plasma glucose is recorded. The glucose levels in the blood should drop with a normal insulin response. Consequently, two hours after the oral glucose tolerance test, the BM or the blood sugar should be less than 7.8 millimoles per litre. If it remains above 11, then that diagnosis diabetes. An oral glucose tolerance test of between 7.8 and 11 suggests prediabetes. HbA1c can also be used. A HbA1c which measures the glycosylation of red blood cells over a period of approximately 3 months, which is the lifespan of a red blood cell, of less than 42 millimoles per litre is normal, above 47 is diagnostic and between 42 and 47 millimoles per litre suggests prediabetes. Occasionally HbA1c may be expressed as a percentage. Less than 6% is normal, more than 6.4% is diagnostic of diabetes and a HbA1c of between 6 and 6.4 is suggestive of prediabetes. The reason why we focus on prediabetes is this is an indication that the patient may rapidly progress and Good intervention at this stage can help normalise the patient and head back towards normal glycemic control. Bear in mind that HbA1c cannot be used in all patients. It's not advocated in children or in pregnant women or patients who have had symptoms for less than three months. Moreover, acutely unwell patients or patients who are taking medications that can cause dyslipidemia or hyperglycemia are also excluded from accurate HbA1c measurements. HbA1c can be used but interpreted with great caution in patients with abnormal haemoglobin, anemia or altered, life, altered red cell lifespans due to splenectomy or patients with a recent blood transfusion as these things will interfere with the HbA1c. Another important form of diabetes to be aware of is gestational diabetes. 2-3% to 3 of pregnancies will result in patient developing diabetes and this is known as gestational diabetes. Risk factors are for mothers who are over 30 years old or who have a family history or a previous personal history as well as being non-Caucasian. The complication of developing gestational diabetes is the excess glucose circulating in the mother will be transmitted to the fetus resulting in a high birth weight and neonatal hypoglycemia as the fetus is increasing uh, the secretion of insulin. The, mi the microvascular complications, retinopathy, nef nephropathy and neuropathy. Retinopathy, there are several stages that you should be aware of and we'll talk about that in a moment. Nephropathy is where the kidney is damaged due to the excessive levels of glucose. This can manifest as microalbuminuria and neuropathy is where the patient develops altered sensation uh, in the peripheries 
and this may result in a glove and stocking distribution. If the diabetes affects the autonomic nerves, this will result in autonomic neuropathy and may manifest with the patient feeling lightheaded on standing due to orthostatic hypotension. If the motor nerves are affected, this may result in a motor neuropathy. Retinopathy has four key stages in diabetes. Background retinopathy is where the excess glucose increases the pressure of the vasculature in the retina, leading to microaneurysms and hemorrhages through those aneurysms, as well as the extravasation of hard exudates or lipids. As the blood is leaking, this progresses to stage two, pre-proliferative. So instead of the retina being supplied, there's a slight ischemia and that manifests as cotton wool spots or venous beading. Now the ischemia will cause a reaction in the retina to secrete mitogenic factors such as vascular endothelial growth factor, which will, which will result in the proliferation of new vessels being formed. And this is stage three, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. When this advances to stage four, maculopathy, this is where the macula region, where the highest concentration of cones and rods are, results in sudden drop in visual acuity. The retina may also appear to have a number of burn marks, and this is as a result of treatment for proliferative or maculopathy, where the retina is burnt in a procedure called pan photocoagulation to help reduce proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Macrovascular complications include uh, an acute coronary syndrome, which is four times as common in the non-diabetic patients. If the nerves innervating the heart are also damaged as a consequence of diabetes, this may affect the transmission of nociception or pain, and the patient may suffer a silent MI. Stroke is, is more common in diabetics, as is hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, as well as diabetic feet, where the patient can develop bilateral arteriopathic ulceration. In order to manage patients, it's very important that individualized plans are made with a patient-centered holistic approach. The patient should be educated about the condition and its trajectory and the importance of good interventions. Their personal preferences and accounts, the risk of polypharmacy, their expected benefits should be explained. Negotiate a HbA1c target to try and encourage the patient to improve their glycemic control. Introduce exercise, diet plans, smoking cessation if appropriate, and ask the patient to regularly, to regularly monitor their feet for good foot care. If the patient has recurrent hypoglycemic spells or recurrent symptoms as a result of severe hyperglycemia, they should inform the DVLA, as this may affect their driving. A diet of high fiber, low glycemic index sources of carbohydrates, such as fruit, vegetables, whole grains, and uh, low fat dietary products, oily fish, should be encouraged. A statin therapy, due to its pleiotropic benefits, may be added. Monitor the patient for complications. It's important to manage diabetic neuropathy. This may require a typical painkillers to facilitate relief. Autonomic neuropathy, diabetic feet, kidney disease should all be monitored. If the patient can complains of erectile dysfunction, this would also need to be addressed and the eye, the eye disease needs to be monitored regularly. If patients require drug management, the first line treatment is metformin standard release and if there's GI consequences, modified release can facilitate some of the side effects. Metformin is contraindicated in advanced renal disease or in acute metabolic acidosis, as well as diabetic ketoacidosis. And there are other drugs available, such as DPP-4 inhibitors like the gliptins or pioglitazone or a sulfonylurea. Following the first line treatment, if the glycemic control is not sufficiently controlled, a first intensification of drug treatment can be added. And this can be any class. And if Despite this, the first intensification, the glycemic control does not improve, a second intensification drug can be used. Intensification is there if the HbA1c rises to more than 7.5% and the target is to lower that. 
The non-insulin agents include metformin, DPP-4 inhibitors, pyoglitazone, sulfonylureas, and this can be done in combination with the clinical situation that you face with each patient. And a second intensification is again there to try to facilitate bringing down the HbA1c. If despite these drugs, or there's very poor glycemic control, or there's consequences and micro and macrovascular complications, it may be pertinent to introduce insulin therapy early on. You can offer isophane as an intermediate insulin, or short-acting insulins, and the regimen needs to be negotiated and agreed with the patient, taking into consideration the patient's lifestyle. This busy slide summarizes the NICE guidance of introducing metformin, followed by first and second intensification, and the introduction of insulin-based regimens. Let's focus on some of these drugs. Metformin is a bagwinide. It's an insulin sensitizer and interestingly can cause weight loss, so it's useful in obese patients, but it can result in nausea, diarrhea and abdominal pain, and if these symptoms arise, switch from standard release to modified release. And this cannot be used in very advanced kidney disease or lactic or ketoacidosis. <clears throat> Sulfonylureas, um, such as uh, glycolazide, are insulin secretagogues. Insulin is a um, is a growth factor which can cause weight gain and can of course cause sudden hypoglycemia. Insulin, there are a number of regimens and these require careful titration. Glitazone, such as pyoglitazone or rosiglitazone, these are sensitizers. These can also cause hypoglycemia but are unfortunately associated with fluid retention as well as fractures and liver abnormalities. Sulfonylurea receptor binders such as natiglinide are secretagogues which can cause hypoglycemia. GLP-1 analogues such as enxenatide are incretins. These are gut peptides which increase insulin release but can affect the patient's appetite. DPP-4 inhibitor cetagliptin break down GLP-1 again to, to augment insulin release. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors such as acarbose prevent the breakdown of carbohydrates such as starch but can cause abdominal distension, bloating and flatulence. SGLT2 inhibitors such as the glyphosins block the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 in the kidney which reduces the amount of glucose being reabsorbed. Now as this will increase the glucose concentration within the kidneys which can serve as a medium for bacteria patients can experience recurrent UTIs, hypoglycemia and this needs to be used cautiously in patients with renal disease and this is contraindicated in diabetic ketoacidosis and actually the SGLT2 inhibitors can cause euglycemic keto diabetic ketoacidosis and if this occurs then these, this class of drugs becomes contraindicated. Thank you for attending this medicine masterclass.